Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Today's webinar will be about Lee Stanley Top Time Saving Tips in Clip Studio Paint, presented by Lee Stanley. Before we begin the webinar, there are some housekeeping items that we'd like to go through. The webinar will be approximately one hour long. All attendees will be muted. Question and answer session will be during the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Attendees can ask questions in the GoToWebinar question box right away. Due to time constraints, not all questions will be answered. The webinar will be recorded. The recording will be shared on social media and will be sent via email to all registrants and attendees. The panelists for this webinar are Marie Quinones, myself, and Liz Chow. For those of you who are connecting with us for the first time or, or have never heard about Tip Studio Paint, Tip Studio Paint is your only one solution for stunning, ready to publish illustrations, comics, manga, and animations. Learn more at clipstudio.net forward slash and graphicsly.com. And with that, we'd like to pass the reins of the webinar to Liz and her presentation, Liz Challis. Top time savings in tips in Clip Studio Paint. Thank you so much. Okay, I absolutely love that you said pass the reins <laughs> because um, I'm primarily a horse artist now. Um, so for those of you who are out on the uh, webinar watching right now. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Liz Staley. Some of you may have heard of me before. Um, I've written several books about Clip Studio and um, done several courses. Um, I'm currently doing a series of blogs um, on the Graphicsly site and also on uh, CSP Tips. Um, we post about once a week, just doing different tutorial things. Um, so just wanted to introduce myself a little bit of, of my history with uh, Clip Studio. I started using this software back when it was called Manga Studio 4. <laughs> um, it's been a long time, I think, oh gosh, it was probably like 2011, um, 2012. The all of the books and the courses that I have out right now are through a company called Pact Publishing, P-A-C-K-T. Um, the first book that I wrote was Mastering Manga Studio 5 that came out in 2013. Um, then I wrote the Manga Studio EX5 cookbook that came out in 2015. Um, 2018, so about two years ago now, I um, was the author on Lip Learn Clip Studio Paint second edition. Um, and there's actually a third edition of that that is going to be, that is in the works. Um, and I'm going to be a co author on that. I'm not sure when that one's going to be out. I also, through PACT, have three video courses. Um, so for those of you that like to um, get your information um, with video and audio, um, these may be right for you. So back when I started using Clip Studio, I was actually creating a webcomic. Um, I created this webcomic from 2010 to 2017. Um, I'm actually no longer doing comics. Um, I primarily consider myself to be a storyteller. Um, whether that be through comics or just illustrations in general. Um, and about two years ago, two and a half years ago now, I started um, really concentrating on doing more animal art. Um, I've always loved to draw horses. Um, as you can see here, I have a horse. This is my horse. I wanted to put a picture of her up because I figured if I mentioned one that we might, you know, that I mentioned if I have one, somebody might want to see my, my fuzzy cupcake. <laughs> so um, I shifted to doing more animal art, but I still, parts of my process 
even though I do a lot of my coloring with colored pencils and Copic markers and acrylic paint, there are parts of my process, a good bit of my process, that I still do in Clip Studio. So here's uh, some recent examples of my art. Um, you can see that I do I do a lot of stuff on vintage map pages, and uh, the map pages all have significance. So what I do is, so just to explain my process briefly, I actually do all of my sketching in Clip Studio. So here is this, uh, this carousel horse. So this was my sketch file. And I actually built it up in Clip Studio. And then once I have the sketch done, then I will um, print it and transfer it to the good paper. So there's the finished sketch. So then I print from Clip Studio and uh, white box the sketch onto whatever, either a map or a Bristol or whatever I'm going to use, and then add color. So a good portion of my process still happens through Clip Studio, even though I no longer would consider myself to be a comic artist. Um, also, a, a note about the comic that I used to run, I no longer control the website domain that used to be associated with that comic. So I'm not even going to, I'm not going to say the name of the comic because I don't want anyone to go Google the, the comic and end up on the, what's currently on the website because I don't have any control over what is on that domain now. I don't own it. I lost it a year and a half ago. So, so that is a kind of brief history of um, me and Clip Studio and kind of where my art is now. Uh, a big thing that I talk about in all of my books and my tutorials and courses is kind of how to save time. Um, I'm kind of an impatient artist. I like to get in and uh, get whatever I'm envisioning in my head out on paper. So I'm always looking for ways to save any bit of time in my process. So I'm going to share some of my favorite time saving tips. And then like Mario said, um, any uh, um, time left at the end of the webinar, you guys can ask me questions and I'll answer as many as I can. So the first uh, time saving tip that I want to go over, I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger so that you guys can see it a little better. So the first uh, time saving tip that I want to go over, I'm gonna make a new file here. This will work. So I'm going to make a new file. I want to talk about auto actions. And I actually did a written tutorial about auto actions recently that you can find over on the Graphicsly blog. Um, but I think that they are so underrated for how useful they can be. Um, a lot of people don't even know what auto actions are, what they can do. So you can find your auto actions down here with your layers, um, provided that you uh, have this set up at, at default. So when you open up the auto actions, there's this default panel here. And there's a couple of um, different default things here that you can do. Um, like, so if I click on this create draft layer, let me pull this out of here, go to layers so you all can see what's happening. So create draft layer. So if I click on that and select it, these buttons down here, they become active. And I can play this auto action. Auto actions are a recorded set of steps. And you can actually see what those steps are if you click on the little arrow next to the name. So let's say I use a lot of draft layers. I could have this set up 
and just hit the play button, there's a draft layer that it automatically creates. It didn't have to do anything but click that one button. But so that is a very simple use for auto actions. But you can get extremely complicated with auto actions. Uh, I mentioned this action that I recorded in the tutorial that I wrote. This is like a 53 step process <laughs> that makes something look like a old uh, like color halftone comic. Let me see if it'll run on on this. So let's say I wanted to make this look like an old timey comic. Sometimes it sometimes it works just fine. It depends on the image. Um, so instead of doing each one of these 53 steps for you all, I can instead press play. It runs through all the steps. And now we have this halftone effect that makes this image look like an old print, like what you would see in like an old comic. So obviously not having to do those 53 steps is very handy. I'm just gonna close that and not save it. So I'm gonna show you guys how to create a very simple auto action that will just show you the process of how to do it. And then anything that you can think of um, just about you can create an auto action for. There are a couple of things that auto actions won't record, stuff like uh, changing your brush size, um, and I think like picking the drawing color, that there's a couple little things that it won't record, but things like running a filter um, or uh, changing a selection size, filling, um, changing layers, renaming layers, it will pick up all of that. And so a couple more uh, examples here. So these are um, from Brian Allen of Flyland Designs. I, he has great brushes if you haven't seen them. But he has these fantastic actions where, you know, oh, so I want a center guide on this canvas. Let's see if it'll do it. Oh, okay. Whatever. Uh, I'm not sure why it's not playing, but something isn't right about this file. So that one worked when I tried it before. <laughs> so anyway, um, if you have a process that you do constantly over and over and over again that has different steps, you can just make an auto action and I'll even show you how to set it up to a keyboard command so you can literally do whatever this is, whether it is resizing a whole bunch of images to like web size or setting up an image. Um, you can just have it happen automatically and it will save you a bunch of time if it's something that you do a lot. So um, I'm going to show you how I would set up an auto action to set up a file that I'm going to draw in like that one I showed you before with the sketch of the carousel horse. What I like to do is have a folder for all of my actions. Um, so I have custom actions. The way that you can make one of those is in the auto action. Uh, palette, you're going to click on this icon here, create new auto action set. Click on it and webinar action. And we'll click on OK. So that automatically created a new category for us. And now I'm going to name this first action. So uh, new file setup and hit enter. 
All right, so now we are ready to record. So you want to be set up and ready to go. Um, since I'm going to be doing a setting up a new file, I've got my file that I'm going to, I've got a file open. It doesn't really matter what the file is for this action. I'm just going to be setting up the layers. So you just want to make sure that you are ready to go before you hit that record button, because anything you do after you hit that record button will be recorded into this action. And so you may have to go back and redo it or tweak it. So down here, little red circle button and says start to record auto action. So I'm going to click that. We're now recording. So anything we do now is going to be recorded into this new file setup. So over here on my layers, I'm going to click on new roster layer. Then double click. We'll name this one rough sketch. And then we'll set it to blue. And for that, I just went to the layer property and clicked on layer color. Um, if we have time, I'd love to go over this feature a little bit more because I think this is one of the best things about Clip Studio, but <laughs> we'll get into that later, hopefully. So now I'm going to come back and you can see that it's already starting to record these steps. It's so now new raster layer. Sketch refined. Enter. And then I'm going to create a third layer. Rename it final sketch. Those are, uh, you know, the three layers that I would normally do for one of my normal illustrations, one of my horse drawings or cat drawings. So probably would have a rough and then refine it and then do a final pass. So it's all is going to depend on your process. You want to think about your process and what you normally do and what you can do to automate as much of it as possible. So now that I have those set up, I'm going to click the stop button. And now we have this action. So I can create a new file. So I'm just going to pick one of these. Let me just make sure. Oh, no, I don't want you to make multiple pages. We would have been sitting here for a minute waiting for that to create. OK. All right. So totally brand new file. You can see over here, I've just got the paper layer and I've got layer one. And in fact, I'm going to get rid of layer one because I don't need it. Got my action, new file setup. Got it selected. Click play. Boom, there's our layers. So. A way to make this even more useful is to set it to a, a keyboard shortcut or a shortcut in your command bar. So to do that, I am going to open up the shortcut settings, which is under file. So these are our shortcut settings, and you can go through here and set all kinds of shortcuts for everything under the sun, basically. Just about anything you can do in Clip Studio, you can set a shortcut for. So under this setting area, we'll go to Auto Action. So now it's going to bring up our categories in our Auto Action uh, window. So I'm going to go under Webinar Action. New file setup. So now I need to click edit shortcut. And I'm going to do control F6. So 
So when you go to do your shortcut, after you hit that edit shortcut, you actually want to perform whatever shortcut it is on your keyboard to set it. So I actually held down my control key or shift key or whatever you want, and then hit whatever, you know, for, so for me for F6. Now, if I wanted to, you know, I could just set it for P or some other uh, key that's not being used. But most likely, probably all the just letter keys are being used. So, so there we go. It's got control F6. And you can also, you can add more shortcuts if you want. You can click on add shortcut. And we could try um, Q. So when I pressed, when I tried to set U for the shortcut, it's going to tell me U is already used by these, by this tool. So if I tell it that I do want to use U for this action, then it will delete the keyboard shortcut for the figure, frame border, and ruler subtools. So I don't want to do that. No, don't do that. So it will warn you if you are about to overwrite a existing shortcut key. All right, so we've got our control F6. I'm going to hit OK. And let me delete these. All right, I'm going to put this guy back in here. All right, so I'm going to hold down control, hit F6. There's my layers. So that's it. I mean, it only saved me 30 seconds, but if you're drawing a lot of stuff, those 30 seconds, they add up. And that's just a thing that I'm always, you know, trying to figure out, like, what can I do to make things easier? You can also set a lot of the time, um, since I use a Wacom Cintiq, um, it's on a monitor arm. So a lot of the time when I'm working, I have my Cintiq sitting in front of me and my keyboard's behind it. So sometimes it's hard for me to get to the keyboard. So I might want to set a command bar icon instead so that I can just press it with my stylus. So for that, we just do file and we go to the command bar settings and then this guy is gonna come up. And this is, this is just like the shortcut settings. You can put any sort of anything. You could put every tool ever and every command ever up in your command bar if you want to. Which, by the way, this this thing here, this guy right here, this is your command bar. So if you didn't know what it's called, that's what it's called. It's called the command bar. <laughs> and uh, it's already full of some very helpful options. But we want to put our auto action up there. So I'm going to click on my auto action from the drop down. Go to webinar action, new file setup, add. And then this icon comes up. And it's at the end here, but I can move it. So say I'm just going to click and drag. And that red indicator is where it's being moved to. So let's say I want to put this guy, I'm going to put this guy over here. So wherever you drop this, it's going to show up. I'm going to put this guy right here. So now, if I'm going along, working, doing my drawing, and I've got my Cintiq in front of me, I can't get to my keyboard right now, I can just use my stylus and just click on that, and boom, got my layers. I keep on drawing, and you know, everything is great. <laughs> I'm just having a party with my music on doing my drawing. <laughs> so that's how you can set up an auto action. And again, like the, the sky is practically the limit on those. Um, so anything that you like, like I said, resizing images, um, maybe you've got a ton of pages from a, your graphic novel that need to be resized or resaved 
set it up as an auto action, run that, and you've saved yourself a bunch of time. So that was my first one. Now I want to talk about making materials. And materials are really cool. Materials you will find in your material library, which is this guy. It's usually docked over here on the right, so long as you haven't um, closed it permanently or moved it around. So some of you may be kind of familiar with materials um, in general from like downloading brushes or downloading um, screen tones or background pictures from the um, CSP assets which if you haven't looked in there, it's awesome. Uh, one of the things that I love doing with materials is of course, saving myself time. So say you have a comic that you're drawing and um, one of your characters has a slogan on their t-shirt or a graphic on their t-shirt. Instead of redrawing that over and over and over again, you can save that as a material and then just drop it onto the character when you need it and warp it. So I'm gonna show you how to, we're gonna make a simple material um, and then I'm gonna show you how to, well, we're gonna make a simple pattern and show you how to save it as a material and then how to uh, put it onto a piece of clothing, a drawing of clothing so that it looks not flat. Uh, <laughs> by the way, um, this pattern here um, is one that I created. We're gonna do a simple pattern for today. You can do things more with more complicated repeats, like what is in this icon. And this one I actually made for a um, tutorial that is over on Graphicsly. I'm not sure of the address right now, but it's actually how to just make a repeating pattern. And another thing that you can do with these repeating patterns is this is actually a piece of fabric that I had made from this pattern that I drew. So now I can make items from this fabric because I made this repeating pattern. So in, you don't have to do just, you know, 2D illustrations or prints or something. You can make something cool like a piece of fabric and then turn that into something if that's something you're into. Like say you are wanted to be a fashion designer, um, you know, or you just are like me and weird and like to make patterns. <laughs> I find something very, um, very calming about making patterns. So that's just an intro of or just a idea of something else that you could do with this skill. Um, and I do, I get this fabric through a company and I can actually sell it online. So that's like another income source for me as an artist is selling fabric. So just a, another idea of something that you can do with materials. Doesn't have to just be for your illustrations. All right. So to make like i said we're just going to make a quick material and i open this one for this but so you want to think about before you go to make your material what you want to do so for this um i just want to make like a simple like checkerboard kind of this like kind of gingham print uh whatever it's called so i went looking for these for this kind of design and so looking at a example of it will help you making the actual repeating pattern because you want that pattern to look convincing <laughs> like you want it to repeat seamlessly or else it's going to be like why is that weird why is there a weird line on it so looking at this pat looking at this design um I want to break it down into the smallest uh, part. And I'm just using, just using this one as a reference. So the smallest repeat is this four block 
uh, square here. So this is really all I need to make to make this pattern. I need to make a square that is divided in half both ways. So pre-planning that will definitely help with your um, making process. So this um, is, this is just a 300 pixel by 300 pixel, um, 300 DPI canvas that I made, which will be perfect. Um, I like to do things at a higher DPI so that in case I decide, oh, I want to use this to make to print fabric or whatever, or, you know, I'm going to put this on a drawing and then print the drawing, then the material will look good, then the texture will look good. So I need a grid. So I'm going to go to view and then grid. So this is showing the default grid, but I just need a center line. I don't need nine squares, I need four. So view, grid slash ruler settings. And part of the reason why I did, why I made my canvas the size that I did was because I could chop it down in, into uh, sections easier. So I'm gonna go to gap here on the settings of grid. And since I need four boxes I need to divide um, evenly, horizontally, and vertically, and it's a 300 pixel square canvas, then I need a gap of 150 pixels. Number of divisions, this is if you want to subdivide it, but I don't need any subdivisions, so I'm just going to do zero. So there, now I have my four squares. And so now I can fill them with these colors. So this bottom square, I'm going to leave white. I'm going to grab my rectangle tool. Oh, we can make this easier. Hang on. Do, do. I'm going to put this on snap to grid, which is this icon up here in the command bar so that my tool is going to snap to these lines so I don't have to worry about, oh, am I not on this correctly? All right, so it's selected. Um, so this square up here is kind of darker. So let's, let's, do, let's do blue. All right, so I've got my blue square. And then this square here is a little bit lighter than that square above it. So I'm going to pick a lighter blue, slightly lighter, and then just fill that. And then this square over here, So now when we set this up for our material and it repeats, we should get kind of the uh, interpretation of this gingham pattern. <laughs> it doesn't have to be perfect. And of course, setting up these materials um, can take some time in the beginning, but then once you reuse them over and over again, then it ultimately saves you time. All right. So now that I have this done, now we need to register it so that it shows up over here in my materials. So go to edit, register material. Oh wait, hold on. Before we do that, layer, flatten image. Whatever is on the currently active layer is what's gonna be saved. So since I only had these three squares on that layer, it would have just saved these three squares. 
Now that would be great if you wanted to say use this, but you know, have like a black square over here. So it was like a darker pattern or be able to use it over different colors. But I just want this. So I'm just gonna flatten it so that I just save these. All right, edit, register material, image. Okay, material name, blue gingham. Remember to name your material something that you'll remember. This material image is just showing us what our material looks like. We're uh, not going to worry about these because we're not making a paper texture or a brush tip. I am going to turn on scale up and down because if we put this on something and then we need it bigger or smaller, I want to do it right away. So adjust after pasting. Um, so this will give us the option to adjust the scale after we put the material on. Tiling, and we want repeat. So we've got a couple of different repeat options. So this is just going to repeat it the same from left to right, top to bottom. You can do reverse, which you can see it's like grouping the white. So if you wanted bigger squares, like this will just give a different kind of effect. And then flip probably isn't going to do too much for this one. So I'll just put it on repeat and then you can have it um, tile only horizontally, only vertically. We want it to go vertical and horizontal. So we're gonna just leave it there. Specify overlay. This is where you set where in the layer stack it shows up. So if you're saving a sound effect that is going to be above your, you know, whenever you paste it in, you want it to be on the very top layer, um, then you want to leave it here. Um, or if you're making, say, a background image that you always want to be at the bottom of the layer stack, you would put it here. Um, for this, it's, it doesn't really matter because you can, of course, always drag the layers around. Um, I'm probably going to be using this, say, as like a background behind something or under line art. So I'll probably put it here-ish and then I can always just adjust. Location to save material. You definitely you want to put this in a folder where you're going to be able to find it because if you make a bunch of these, then you're not going to be able to find anything. <laughs> so um, I just clicked here to expand this, and these are our categories under our materials library. I'm going to go to color pattern because it's pattern and it's in color, and then pattern, close pattern, close pattern sounds good. Now, search tags. Um, some people may not like to use these. I do. And I always add one tag that, I, that I've come up with that I put on every single material that I make so that I can find everything that I have added to my materials very quickly. And that is custom <laughs> because that's how I roll. Uh, we'll do gingham. We'll do plaid we'll do blue fabric so you just type it in hit enter and add a new one you just click on this little icon um, that's probably plenty to be able to find this later so those are what all i like to do you can use whatever search tags you want but they're great for if you're going to be making a bunch of materials and then you need to find them later so with all of that in there, I'm going to click on OK. So now over in our materials layer, layer, there's our gingham. So we've got that made. So now I'm going to show you quickly how to put this onto a, um, a shirt. So I drew this shirt earlier. And 
I can just go in here and you know, I can just go in here and select this shirt. And just have the pattern that I made and just click on paste. You know, and adjust it. And I mean, that's fine, but it doesn't look convincing. It looks flat, right? So instead of doing that, delete. So instead of doing that, what I like to do for clothing when I'm doing, say, a pattern all over a piece of clothing. Is I work in pieces. And if, you, if you've read any of my books or um, read any of my tutorials, you probably already know this trick <laughs> because this is one I use a lot. So I'm going to start with this sleeve. And I'm going to just draw around it with just the lasso tool. And you want to leave space. Uh, this is probably almost not enough space over here, but we're going to go with it. You want to leave space because we're going to adjust this pattern after we put it on so that it looks curved like it fits with the fabric. So we need a little space around the edges so that we can adjust. So now I've got that and I'm going to hit paste. I'm going to resize this. Let's make it 50. 50 both ways, that way it'll be easy to remember. And I'm gonna drag it under our line art. Ooh, that could be smaller, hang on, let's make it 25. There we go, okay, that's better. So if you're doing this in pieces, just try and remember if you have to scale it up or down what you scaled it to. So with this sleeve, now I'm going to right click on my layer and rasterize it so that I can edit it further. So now I've got just this big old piece of pattern over here hanging out. Now I'm going to go to edit, transform, mesh transform. So these little control points that you see here, actually hang, hang on just a second. Let me get rid of this layer mask. Uh, apply mask to layer. This little guy's called a layer mask. If you don't know what it what it is, it's basically just hiding part of this. So I am going to apply mask to layer so that this is easier to manipulate. All right, that's better. Let's try this again. <laughs> okay, mesh transform. So this lattice of points here is going to let us warp this, and it's pretty cool. However, a, a word to the uh, the wise. If you think that you need more control points than four by four, over here in the tool properties is a way that you can adjust how many control points there are. Do that before you touch any of the control points because once you move one, you cannot add more or take away. So I think I'm going to need a little bit more control. All right. Now that I have those like that, now I'm going to look at my shape. And I'm just going to move these around so that this follows the shape. This takes a little bit of practice and a little bit of kind of eyeballing. Okay, I think I'm happy with that. So you just want to think about the shape of whatever this piece of fabric is. Click on OK. And now I can just 
select around here. So select and then delete outside. And that looks a lot better than just that flat material. And if you have a, very quickly, if you have a character that just has a design on their shirt, like like this, uh, maybe this is a design on your character's shirt. You can paste it on, just save this as material. I forgot how big that material was. And just resize it. Pop it on your character's shirt. Rasterize it. And then just do a little mesh transform or perspective or whatever you need to do to make it look more like it's part of the fabric instead of just plopped on there, pasted on there. So, so with this shirt, um, I want to open it up to questions, but I would have gone in and, you know, you could, you could be as detailed as you wanted to be. You could do the collar separate from the main body and do the cuffs separate and do each part of the bodice separate, you know, it all depends on what you want to do. But this is, I think, one of the best tricks for saving some time. You can make a bunch of patterns or just save um, your character's t-shirt designs. Or if you have a character with a lot of tattoos, this is also a great thing to do for tattoos. So instead of drawing them over and over and over again, draw them out flat, um, just the design flat, and then save them as a material. And you can, when you draw that character, just pop them onto the character from your materials library, raster, you know, resize it, rasterize it, and then do mesh transform or whatever you need to do in order to get that to fit the shape of your character's body. So, okay. I want to open it up to questions because I ran over just a little bit. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I think, as you mentioned, the sky's the limit. So, the creativity is open. Yeah. Uh, That's also... one of the things I love about Clip Studio is that yeah. the sky is pretty much the limit. You can use it for almost anything. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure everybody will, will now try to see the mesh materials and all of it to create fabric on their own. So yeah, it's also a really other amazing way to see how the illustration is not only focused on comics, but Cliff Studio Paint is also open to fashion design, etc. Yeah, I was I was really happy that that piece of fabric came in two days ago because I was like, oh good, I can get a picture of it. <laughs> this video, so can you show it again? And, yeah. And also share the the digital one. So that's that uh, fabric uh -huh. that is literally just this pattern here. And I just had it uh, created on fabric. Um, it's a company called Spoonflower. Their fabric uh -huh. is a little expensive, but it's it's good quality. <laughs> yeah, you can tell. That's really awesome. Yeah. Um, so, for example, uh, here uh, is a question related to actions. Um, from Catherine, she says, can you delete uh, one step in the auto action if you do something wrong or you have to start all over again? You can go through, so let me open up the auto actions again. So you can go through here and you can delete, you can duplicate. Also, if say I was working, if I knew on a image beforehand, oh, I don't need that um, that first uh, draft layer. I wow. can click these little check marks 
and temporarily turn those steps off. So you can go through and, and delete, like if you made a mistake and you realized after you record all, you know, got all the way through, you can go through and delete and or copy. So, so yes, you can, you can uh, refine it if you make a mistake. That's awesome. And also about how to action and Sterling Martin says, what's your favorite auto action for drawing? My favorite auto action for drawing. <laughs> um, for drawing yeah, sorry. <laughs> probably, probably the one that I use the most is this layer setup one. Um, I'm going to be honest, I am a terrible at naming my layers while I work. <laughs> so I'll get to the end of a complicated thing and I'm like, oh no, where is that at? I've got, got this stack of layers. Um, so if I can do something to name those layers ahead of time, <laughs> then that is great. Um, another one that I like is actually a default action. and that's um, these expand selection and fill. These are great. Um, if we had more time, I would I would show some uh, tricks on flat colors, but we don't. But these are great if, say, you're going in and coloring something. So let's say I wanted to color this sleeve. Oh, my uh, things are off for all layers. So if I wanted to say color this sleeve, I've already got it on there. But you know, if I just fill it with a color, then it's you know gonna be icky. Hang on. So if I just fill it with a color like that, you know, you get that gray kind of gross outline. But if I do this action. it automatically expands. Now over here, it was a little bit too much for it. Um, so it spilled out on the other side of this line. But this is a really fast way to get a nice uh, crisp line there. So those are, prob those are probably the two that I use the most. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and also, I forgot the action, I think. I mean, not the after action, actually, sorry the fabric that you showed in the subview um and um, i think uh Rumi told us how do you access and how do you import uh, images there so all i did to make that fabric um to actually print that fabric was um this the actual file that this pattern came from Hang on, let me open it. I'll have to see my horrible, um, oh, it's in here. So patterns. So I made this file, oh, no, hold on. It is out here. You can see there's more patterns. <laughs> So this is the actual file. This is the square file that that pattern came from. Um, so I, I saved the material here so that I could use it in Clip Studio. But then all I did for that fabric website was literally just saved this as a PNG. So then I just upload it over there and their system automatically repeats. So it can literally, I can get 27 yards of this pattern on fabric because their system will just repeat from this one square, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you use like a minimum amount of DPI for printing it? Uh, I think they recommend at least 150. So right. I, I would create, yeah. I always suggest create at 300 at the very minimum, create at 300, because you can always go down in DPI. <laughs> right. 
so like on this one, you can see that it's uh, 2000 by 2000 pixels and 300 DPI. Mm -hmm. So when I first uploaded this into there, it was it was huge. And then I resized it on their system so that it was a bit smaller and it just repeats itself. Right, that's that's really awesome how, how they made it. Mm -hmm. And um, also, please, um, how do you use this sub view panel? Ah, yes. So I wanted to talk about that one real quick if we had time. I love the sub view panel. It's, I think, mm -hmm. one of the best things about Clip Studio. So the sub view panel, which you guys probably saw me using over here, um, is just this little guy um, kind of hidden behind the navigator. And this is a bank of images. You can put whatever images that you want in here. So right now I've got this and I've got the reference for that carousel horse. So, and when I close Clip Studio and open it back up, the subview saves these images. So I don't have like, say when I was working on my comic, I saved all of my um, character design images in the subview. So that every time I opened it, boom, there's my character designs. I don't have to go opening them. I don't have to go looking for them. They're right there. And all you need to do on the on to um, add an image is just go to sub view. There's this little folder with an arrow down here. It says import. Click on that. Mm -hmm. And then OK. Just find your image. You can zoom in and out on it. You can rotate it. You can flip it around. <laughs> so it's a great way to save any uh, images that you work from a lot. Um, I use this when I'm drawing my horses or drawing cats or dogs. So I'll put any reference images that I'm working on through there. And then to page through them, you just use these arrows. That's and you can really also, awesome. another thing that I did when I was um, doing comic um, is all of my character references had the, the flat like base color that I used for like, okay, this, this character's hair is this color and their shirt is this color. Um, and it was just the flat color and you can, there's an eyedropper. So you can click the eyedropper and then go in here and pick up that color. So like I selected that red from the, the fence here. So I would just have my characters there. And when I was coloring, boom, 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 I was just selecting the colors that I needed straight from that character design image. So no, like, you know, tons of palettes being open. <laughs> right. So that was another no, thing that I did. Just that's a really saver for sure. Oh, yes, absolutely. Because one of the things that I don't like is coloring. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love inking. Inking is my favorite part. Uh -huh. Yeah, but that's really awesome. And I'm pretty sure people will start using it more because it has a lot of advantages for mm -hmm. a lot of people don't even know what it is because when when you first open it it's just this blank you know window it just like when there's nothing in it it just looks like that so you're kind of like what is this <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what to do with this and um, please um another question from uh, will he says um what do you think is the best feature of Flip Studio Bay and what's, uh, what made it Flip Studio Bay and above other software? I mean, you're the expert, so can you share oh, this? Oh, okay. I can't pick a best feature. <laughs> um, because there's too many that I'm like, oh, th like, this is awesome. This is awesome. Um, like, especially now with being able to just go to like the, the CSP assets and download stuff like straight, you know, from other users like brushes and like everything is just too awesome. I, okay, well maybe if I had to pick one feature only, 
it would be the feature that made me buy Manga Studio 4. And mm -hmm. that is the perspective rollers. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, if you can show a little bit of that. Yeah. What? If you can show just a little bit of the rollers. <laughs> Okay, let me see if I can do rulers really fast. <laughs> um, let me not do it in here. Let me open up a new one. So the the whole reason why I bought Manga Studio 4 in the first place was perspective rulers. Because um, I knew I was going to be doing a comic, and I was like, oh, these would make my life so much easier in the long run. So your perspective rulers... Um, now, I will say this, perspective rulers are not a crutch for not knowing how perspective works. Uh -huh. yeah. You can actually go yeah. learn how to draw a perspective <laughs> because they're not going to teach you. <laughs> but um, perspective ruler, it's been a little while since I have set up a perspective ruler. All right, so perspective ruler. So we've got the horizon. They've changed how the perspective ruler works. All right, I'm not actually using my uh, stylus. So with the perspective ruler, you can set up horizon lines, and vanishing points. And my my pen tool is automatically snapping to these. So like I could draw It can be a little finicky. So like right there, you know, building, road, telephone pole. So this is the feature that made me buy Manga Studio. <laughs> uh -huh. And that's because um, they are editable, right? Yeah, so you can you can do one point, two point, three point. Um, uh, somebody made like a fish eye, like a four point one. Um, uh -huh. so you can add however many vanishing points you want, and you know your pen will go ahead and just snap to them. So I could add another vanishing point over here if I wanted. Hey, you stop that. You know, and just do all kinds of crazy vanishing points everywhere. So yeah, if I had to, if I had to pick one, <laughs> um, that would be my favorite feature. Um, as far as what I think it's, what was the other part, like why I think it's better than other software or what makes it stand out from other software? Um, as far as like why I choose it over say Photoshop, it's because it is geared towards uh, digital artists and illustrators, whereas Photoshop is is getting the tools and um, getting the um, features for digital artists, Photoshop was ultimately, was first made for photo editing, not for digital artists. Whereas Clip Studio is made for digital artists. And so I think that the brush tools, the, the pen tools, the watercolor tools, um, you know, I think that all of that is really just, probably about the best thing about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we passed a bit our timing. I'm, I'm really sorry that because there are so many questions. 
but I know you can answer all of them in your articles that are in. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you can invite people to read your articles and also buy your book if you wish, if they wish, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, you can check lists and articles in Graphicsly site and also in Tip Studio Paint site. Uh, tips you being tips, and um, and with that we're wrapping the the webinar. That's so fast. Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you. I'm so glad that uh, that everyone came, and I hope you all got uh, something useful out of it. For sure, for sure. And also one last reminder that for more information about Tips to Paint, please visit Tips to Paint site and. Let me see if you can share it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Studio.net forward slash and, and graphicsly.com. And for those of you who missed something, uh, or if you want to share this webinar, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared on the YouTube channel of Studio Bank channel and also Graphicsly. Also, for more information about Lee Sally, please uh, visit his Twitter, Instagram, and website. And I'm on Facebook too. You're on Facebook too, also. Yep. Uh, so you can also Liz find me. Yeah, Liz Staley Art on Facebook as well. Okay, that's really awesome. Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you for we having really me. We really appreciate yeah. uh, your time. And also, we are thanking all of the people who are still attending. Um, now, uh, you can see the webinar on our YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe to receive a notification when, once it's available. So thank you so much and thank you, Liz, and we'll see you on our next webinar. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.